My name is Jonathan Stars. I want to show you the method of restoring tapes by baking them as discussed in the March 2008 issue of EQ magazine. Now I've been recording for over 40 years. A few years ago as I was playing one of those old tapes and I realized that something had gone terribly wrong with the sound. The high frequencies were missing. Not only that, but when I got done playing just a couple songs, the tape heads were all gummed up. Some of the tapes would make a chattering sound as they stuck and released from the gummy residue. Now I'd read about a problem called sticky shed syndrome and how it gums up the heads, causing screeching and super slow rewind and fast forward. What I was experiencing seemed related to that. But the solutions I'd read about involved expensive convection ovens or a, a plate warmer, which was also expensive and available only in Europe. The problem affects all kinds of tape, from reel-to-reel to, reel to cassette, video, and even digital, which includes DAT and data tapes used for computer backup. I decided that I needed to immediately begin transferring my audio tapes into the computer to prevent further loss. But the process of transferring even a couple minutes of tape proved extremely painful. It consisted of recording a little, then cleaning the heads and starting over again, and then matching up the pieces that uh, I'd recorded. After doing this on a half a dozen tapes, I complained to a friend about it, and I really lucked out because he said he knew about a process, and he'd been using it for quite a while with some really good results. His solution was an inexpensive food dehydrator, which he loaned to me, and I have to say it worked beautifully. After drying a tape, I could play it without have, having to clean the heads at all. So now I want to show you the device and the box it came in so you'll know what you're looking for. First of all, here's the box. As you can see, it's the Snackmaster 2400 food dehydrator, and it can be hard to find on the American Harvest website. Uh, there is actually a more updated box than this one, but it's definitely this particular unit, the uh, Snackmaster dehydrator 2400. And uh, you can find it on eBay, uh, including shipping probably for around $40. But you have to know that they don't, the, the people that list their products on eBay don't always uh, list them in a way that's completely descriptive. So you may have to kind of go through some of, the, some of the listings. And in some cases, you may even have to, um, you, you know, even write a note to the, um, to the person and, and, you know, help them uh, uh, identify, properly identify this unit. Now I'm going to switch over to the unit itself. Now this is the unit itself, and you can see the logo down here, and there's four shelves. We'll get into the details of that later. But as you zoom in, and this is the important part here, is you'll see this wheel that controls the temperature. And the temperature ranges from 95 degrees Fahrenheit, or 35 centigrade, all the way up to 145 Fahrenheit, or 63 centigrade. And the setting that I like to use is between uh, anywhere between... Uh, what is it here? Uh, 120 and on up to 135. Most of the time I set it just at about 130. But that's what you're looking for. That wheel is very important because you need to be able to control the temperature. Now if you decide to try a different brand, be aware that you may have magnetic field problems. For instance, this one has been tested with a magnetometer and it turns out that uh, there don't, uh, for some reason there aren't any stray magnetic fields. Um, but uh, do not get one of the food hydrators that only use heat. I know there's a Ronco uh, unit, and it, doesn't, it just uses heat. It, it, doesn't use, it doesn't have a blower like this one does. Then now I'm going to show you how these things, uh, how you can start putting tapes in the machine. All right, now I have a stack of tapes, and I also have the lid off the machine here. It just fits on like this. I set it to the side. And these are reel-to-reel -reel tapes, uh, seven-inch reels. Some of them are as many as 40 years old. Uh, and this seemed to solve the problem all the way back to uh, uh, tapes made that long ago. Um, the first thing to show you is that there's a piece missing from the center here. I cut this off so that seven-inch tapes would fit into the machine nicely. It's actually a little thing that looks like a crown that fits around here. And I used a, a Dremel tool, which I'll bring out in a few minutes. Um, and I just cut around the edge there to get that off. And then I used a, a file to file the edges smooth. Um, but here's the important part. You really need to vacuum all that 
stuff off because if that dust stays in there, it you know it can blow up in the rest of this, in the rest of your tapes. Now a seven inch tape, and you can see now if there were a crown sitting there, this thing would sit up like so, and you can't get a tape in there and, and keep the machine closed. So by cutting that off, now you can put two tapes in there. You can stack them like this so that they're just offset a little bit. Or if you're really fussy, you can just stack, you know, put one on each level. And one of the things I try to do here, I'm going to show you by uh, reversing the order here, is whenever, whenever I have the tapes in, in here, you can see I've got them in this, this uh, um, orientation here. Then if I would put the next ones on, I would try to orient them the other way so that the, that the air has more of a chance to circulate. Again, if you were going to just be putting perhaps one tape in, you could put one to one side and then another to the other, you know, to the other side and work your way around. And again, as I say, I don't use the bottom tray. I just use that more as a, a spacer just in case there might be something coming out of the magnets that are in the, uh, the blower that's in there. Now this is the uh, motor tool. I, they call it a, uh, gosh, I don't even know what they call it. Anyway, uh, it's a rotary tool. Uh, Dremel makes one, but the one that I have here is a Craftsman, which uh, I've owned for quite some time. Um, and it's just, just a simple tool, a high speed rotation, and you don't press very hard. But I use this to make the cutout around here where that crown was. And later on, I'll show you another place that you may want to make a cutout. The next thing I want to show you is the stacking method. And for this, I'm just going to, I'm going to put three tapes in the machine and show you what I do. As you, as you heat them, I, I leave them in for about a half an hour, and then then it comes time I want to rotate them. I want to keep them moving so that the, in case the, the, uh, uh, the blowers don't quite distribute the heat evenly, I, wanna, I want to be able to uh, control that myself. So what I do then, I take the lid off, and what I do is I make it so that the top one, which is likely the coolest, moves down to the bottom row, actually the second row up, and then everything else moves. But at the same time I do that, I want to rotate the tapes, or I want to flip the tapes, so that the so that if this side is getting the exposure of the heat, the next time for the next half hour, I want the other side. And also sometimes I do rotate them away from the center because um, I have the feeling that because of the way the, uh, the heat comes up, it, it may gravitate toward the center. That's probably not true now that I look right down in here because there's, there's a tape below and it can't blow up through. But anyway, I flip the tapes. So I set this one aside. This is going to become the bottom one. I take the middle, I take this one and flip it. I take the next one and flip it. Then I put these two back together and I put them on top of the one that I want to become the bottom one. I guess you probably couldn't see that. It was off to the side. But this one was in the second position. Now it's on the top. Now let me say about this that this may be me just being fussy. It may not be necessary to continue to uh, change the stacking order. I, I'm not even sure that it's important to flip the tapes, but I do it anyway. Um, people that use these to dry out vegetables and, and fruits, uh, I don't think that they, uh, you know, that they're continually changing the order of the trays. Uh, I don't, I haven't even read the manual to know whether they flip the uh, stuff over or not. But um, I'm doing that. You can make your own decision as to what you do. I'll bet that you'll get pretty good results without any problems. So then the lid goes back on another half hour, and the total time that I use is uh, a two hours for these seven inch reel to reel tapes, quarter inch tape. All right. The next thing I want you to see is that you can then put videotapes in the machine, and uh, the same kind of problem happens with these tapes as happen with other tapes. In fact, I had a beta machine that I had borrowed from someone and it got so gummed up I had to actually have it taken in and cleaned professional, professionally. Even though I know how to go inside and clean a machine, I still needed a professional. It was so badly gummed up. So it's, it's very important to use the same process on videotapes. And of course, I flip them over as well. Now because they're in a cassette format, everything is enclosed, whereas on the audio, regular reel-to-reel -reel tapes, they tend to be open reel. Um, with these, I continue to flip them with the same intent that hopefully it's helping the stuff work its way out. Uh, I'm not really sure, again, whether, whether it makes any difference or not. But you can get two, uh, you know, two of these tapes on, on a shelf, and again, I rotate them. 
Now I do the same thing with cassette tapes because I had a lot of them that weren't playing well. And I, I put them around here sort of oriented the same way and it's mostly easy, it's mostly so I can keep track of what kind of rotation I'm doing on them. Um, I'm, in this case I'm having the opening all point clockwise and I can get, you can get six of them in there, actually you can get seven if you uh, uh, reorient them, but it's not that important. I can't keep up with uh, the transfer of the audio. Uh, these things can cook them more, much faster than I, can, uh, and than I can transfer the audio. And then of course I restack them and flip them back and forth and sometimes end to end as well. Now what I want to show you now is a larger format tape. This is one inch tape and you can put one one inch tape on the top shelf and get the lid to close. But if, if you try to put, uh, put it on the second shelf, what you end up with, and I'm not sure this shows very well from there, there is a little gap here. And that means that you're not gonna get the kind of circulation that you're looking for. So in, the ca in that case, there's something that, that the company itself offers, which is they offer a special tray where this section will come out and you end up with just a spacer so that, uh, um, so that you can put larger objects in it. And in this case, uh, a tape like this would be just fine. Um, at the same time, you could uh, take one of these units itself and take the tool, the uh, uh, motorized tool that I was showing you before, and cut around the edge and actually take this section right out, and you would end up with a spacer uh, exactly, well, similar to the one that they have. Theirs is great because it's, it's actually meant to be removed and put back together if you want to. So that's with a one inch tape. Now, in the case of a two inch tape, you don't even have a choice because you can't get the lid on at all with that, uh, you know, without a huge gap um, with a two inch tape. And there was something else I found too that it seems like the two inch tapes need to, to bake for much, much longer than the than a quarter inch tape. Maybe it's because the, it's not open reel. Uh, maybe it's because it's just so much stuff that needs to be dried out. And you've got to think this stuff is packed tightly together so that as it's heating, the, the vapors have to work their way out through the edges. I'm not really sure what it is, but I do know that when I uh, worked with a, a one inch tape, th that it did take, um, I, I baked it one time and then went to the studio to transfer it and it didn't turn out very well. I had to actually go back and bake the tape again for a total of six hours. Um, and the thing that's nice about this, you can bake it as many times as you need to. So that shows you that part with a, with a large format, but it works great. Now, the one thing that I do need to tell you though, is that I did find on some of my larger tapes that the edge tracks didn't play very well. I had some bass that kind of faded in and out, and I ended up actually having to recreate the base. But I was able to retrieve those tracks from 40 years ago that, uh, um, you know, the rest of the tracks, the inside tracks, sounded just fine. So, so there's that. Now, the final part that I wanted to discuss that wasn't in the article anywhere is that cassette tapes themselves can suffer from a separate degradation that you might not know about. And that is that this little pad that's in here can come loose and literally the, the glue that holds it in place can come loose and these things will float around in there. They might look like they're okay, but the, the sound will be kind of fading in and out and sometimes disappearing altogether. And so what I will do is I'll take a cassette uh, like this that has screws in it. I'll remove the screws and place the tape from the faulty cassette into, the, uh, into one that's working fine. And uh, in, in the cases where they just have screws on the one that's faulty, it's no problem taking them out. But otherwise, I actually have to get in the back with a screwdriver and break open the case. You risk uh, damaging the tape. I, for some reason, I've never had any problem with that. But uh, your other choice is to throw the tape away. So, you know, you, you make the decision of what's, uh, what's the best choice for you. So there you have it. That's the American Harvest Food Dehydrator. You may prefer something else, but these turn out to be readily available. As I said, these have been tested with a magnetometer, so it seems to be a logical and safe choice. I've been really pleased, and I hope you have as good results as I did. Thank you.